Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I'd want this to be a big, big church. I like this intimacy right here. You know, I read uh, something recently that all the big mega churches are starting to dwindle down because people want the intimacy of a, a smaller congregation, and, and here's proof why. Here we are. All right. So, well, good morning, everybody. Um, for those that are visiting today, we've been in a, a sermon series uh, the last two weeks. This is the last sermon um, of our series called um, Reclaiming the Pilgrim Mindset. And in this sermon series, what we did is we've, um, we've talked about what it's like to be a pilgrim passing through this earthly domain that we're in. And we learned that Christians, you know, we are literally pilgrims passing through. In the Bible, it portrays us as strangers in exile. And that's right out of Hebrews. And that's where we learn that our citizenship isn't of this world. Our citizenship is of the heavenly realm, not here. So in that first uh, sermon we talked about two weeks ago, I talked about the need to have what we called a, a double vision, to be able to see like you are right now in the normal world, but also have that spiritual vision where you can see the, the things that God is doing through all things. And last week we talked about the importance of needing faith, that we can stay on that narrow path and not get distracted onto the broader path that leads to destruction. And, and I have to be honest, I was a little brutal last week. I started my sermon by talking about, there it is right there in Genesis 3, you're a sinner. And the whole rest of the Bible is about how terrible the sinner you are. Then you get all the way to Revelation. It says, you're going to die, and you're going to be judged. And I said, you need to repent. It was pretty brutal. And you came back. <laughs> well, today is going to be a, a lot lighter in tone. Because I want to turn our attention to a question that is of interest to every single one of you here. What happens after you die? Where do we go? See, that question was the reward part of the pilgrim's progress. The promise made to the pilgrims was, what is the glory that happens at the end of that long, narrow path? Where do you arrive? So what is this pilgrim's reward? Before I came here as your pastor, you all know I was working as a, a hospice chaplain. And probably one of my favorite things about being a hospice chaplain is literally being around those folks that are in their last hours because through them, I discovered what it meant to love Christ. You would think it'd be the other way around. But I was helping them Move along. That's not the way it worked at all. I remember a sweet old lady. She was in the last hour of her life. And she said to me, she said, you know, I know this is all part of God's plan and we're on God's schedule. I just wish he'd hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> Another fascinating part of being with people before they pass is they, they often will have encounters or conversations with people that aren't in the room. Six months ago, yesterday, my mother went to be with the Lord. She was 91. And the day before she died, my, my wife and I we were sitting by her bed, and she sat up in the bed, and she started talking to her sister Mildred. Mildred wasn't in the room. Mildred died three years ago. And, of course, we're only hearing one side of the conversation, but I heard my mother clearly say, Mildred, what time do we catch the train? And then she said, 12 o'clock, oh my. And that was it. No more of that conversation. The next morning, about 4 a.m., she passed. And I can't help but think that Mildred came and took her to catch that heavenly express train. But uh, it was nowhere near noon. I think they were on like on heaven standard time or something, <laughs> you know. 
we were both like, eh, well, we got till noon. <laughs> so I'm sure a lot of you maybe have witnessed similar types of things when you've been with family. But those moments, they offer us this, this glorious peek behind the, the veil of earthly life. Becky shares a story about her mother as she was passing. She looked up in the cooler room, raised up her arms and said, Mommy. Have any of you had similar experiences? And you know, it doesn't have to be something that glorifying, something that fantastic. But I'm sure all of you have had the opportunity to feel that sense of peace that came over a room. That unexplainable feeling of connection to something greater, or maybe just the relief of knowing they're out of pain and they're going to somewhere so glorious. See, that's what happens. God, God gives us the presence of himself right there with us, even in the midst of our grief of losing someone we love, he's there. So if we're in the presence of God at those final moments, it definitely begs the question, what happens next? St. Thomas Aquinas is probably one of the most influential thinkers on the question of the afterlife. Before Aquinas came along, any of the conversations or the thought around uh, the soul or the afterlife, that, that was all ambiguous. What you believed about any of that stuff was grounded in either Greek philosophy or pagan mythology. It wasn't until Aquinas came around in the 1200s and he, passioned, or he, he argued passionately for the, the immortality of the human soul. Aquinas taught that a soul is a spiritual substance that continues to exist even after the body's gone. He said the human soul is made for union with God. And this union is what provides the ultimate fulfillment and happiness for the soul. I kind of like that. That from birth, we are meant to be with God. Aquinas also believed that after death, the righteous soul would experience a direct personal encounter with the divine. He describes this as the, the highest form of human happiness is to be in the presence of God. He also emphasized the resurrection of the body. He taught that at the end of time, our, our physical bodies would be reunited with our souls and that enable us to experience that transcendence into that divine world in human form. I know a lot of you are thinking, but that's what we all have been taught. It's right there in the Bible, Pastor. You're right, it's in the Bible. But no one talked about it until about 800 years ago. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul describes how believers will put on this new resurrected body, and he refers that to being clothed in our heavenly dwelling. And when we think about the resurrection of the body, I think most of us, we think about Jesus after three days in the tomb, he comes out, and he's in body form, and no one recognizes him. Remember Mary, thought he was the gardener. The two fellows on the road to Emmaus, they walk all the way to Emmaus. They have no clue they're walking with the resurrected Christ. And those apostles all secluded in that room. And when Jesus came to them, they couldn't believe what they saw. But he ate with them. He drank with them. And a little while later, old doubting Thomas, he couldn't believe it. He had to touch his wounds before he would believe. We are living in this modern age of Christianity. And by modern, I'm saying this last 800 years, everything has changed about what has been taught because they weren't teaching the Bible. It was a hidden secret. 
unfortunately, thanks to people like Aquinas, we can be confident that when we die as believers, we receive this new imperishable body. My only hope is that my body is going to be tall, dark, and handsome. (laughs) But my wife, she's really kind. She said, I already am. (laughs) When it's dark, (laughs) he's handsome. (laughs) So the next question is, now here you are, you're all dressed up in this imperishable body, but where are we going? What's the destination? And one of the neat things is that Aquinas gives us a, a lot of clear insight about this, but Jesus tells us even more. As Jesus is dying on the cross, he tells the prisoner next to him, today you will be with me in paradise. I don't know about you, but I kind of like the idea of going to paradise. Paradise. But I suspect my idea of paradise and your idea of paradise might be two completely different things. So again, through Scripture, we can see that Jesus had a lot to say about what the afterlife is, what to expect. But we have to dig through the Scriptures to find these nuggets. In the parable of Lazarus, and uh, Lazarus of the rich man, that's what it's called, If you remember, Lazarus was being comforted while bound below all the unrighteous were suffering. Jesus is already telling us that there is a place of comfort that we're going to go. And throughout his ministry, Jesus, he constantly painted this vision of heaven as as a place of unspeakable joy and peace and fellowship with God. This was a, it was a realm of where all the brokenness of the world is just fully healed. In the gospel, we find a very vivid description of the promise that Jesus makes to us. John 14, 2 to 3, he says, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go, when he taught the disciples to pray, And we prayed it just a few minutes ago. He used the words, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Did you catch it? On earth as it is in heaven. Now you all know I used to be an engineer. So I have to tinker with stuff. So I thought, I'm just going to reverse engineer that that statement. And if if we could, we could actually reverse engineer and say, well, if this new heaven looks like this and we have a blueprint for what it's going to look like, then heaven certainly must look a lot like that. Does that make sense? Let's, let's try this. God gave us wonderful details about the new heaven, and, and they're found in the book of Revelation. Oh, no, he's going to talk about Revelation. <laughs> you know, most pastors don't preach Revelation. They think it's too scary for Sunday mornings. You guys aren't afraid, are you? All right. So in Revelation, God gave us wonderful details, literally a blueprint for what this new heaven is going to look like on earth as it is in heaven. So we get an idea of what heaven must look like if this is what on earth as it is in heaven is going to look like. And in Revelation, for you that aren't familiar with the text, let me just give you a little bit of background. Here's the opening verses from Revelation. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel, his servant, John. Okay, so this version of the end times, it's authored by God. Jesus says, angel, go tell John, because I want him to spread the word across the entire world. And the next verse says that it's John who testifies to everything he saw, that is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. So here we have in the beginning, and then we have the end in our Bible. We have the blueprint showing exactly how God built the world the first time, 
and the blueprints for what he's going to do to restore the new creation at the end of times. And in Revelation, we find this description in just incredible, breathtaking detail. So I'm going to ask you all in just a second, if you close your eyes with me, because what I've done is I've taken a lot of the different pieces of the description of heaven, and I brought them together, and I'm going to put them into just kind of a little story, as John might have told the story if he's bringing this all together. So if you want to close your eyes, snoring's optional. You ready? Okay. This is John telling the story. A breathtaking vision, breathtaking vision unfolded before my eyes, a new heaven and a new earth. Descending from the sky was a holy city of New Jerusalem, shimmering with the radiance of a bride adorned for her husband. Surrounding this glorious city is a magnificent wall towering skyward and constructed the finest jasper, sparkling like diamonds in the light. The foundations of the wall were layered with the most precious gemstones, jasper, sapphire, emeralds, and more, each one gleaming with unique brilliance. As I glazed upon the city, the street shone with the luster of pure, transparent gold, so clear it was like walking on glass. At the heart of the celestial city flowed a crystalline river, the water of life itself bursting forth from the very throne of God and the Lamb. And on both banks of this river stood the tree of life. Its lust foliage and the the bountiful fruit gave substance and abundance and rejuvenation to everyone in this eternal dwelling. No longer would there be any curse or darkness For the glory of God Almighty would be the city's radiant light, and Christ would be the eternal lamp. The servants of God would worship him face to face, his name emblazoned on their foreheads as they reveled in his presence forevermore. How do you like that? Can you imagine seeing that as an invitation into a new neighborhood? Imagine reading that on a brochure for a new development going in. Hey, I'm in. I want to live in a celestial city. No pain, no more darkness, no POA fees. This is the pilgrim's reward. To one day live in the home that the creator of the universe prepared for all his people. It's a dream of unimaginable splendor and peace and everlasting life. This is the destination that Jesus promises to make when he says that the only way to the Father is through me. This destination is the promise that Jesus makes when he says it's all yours if you're willing to be accountable for your sins and repent. But heaven's so much more than a destination. It's a reunion. It's a reunion with those we knew and loved and we toiled in this inhospitable place called earth. But more importantly, it's our long-awaited union with God. I thought about, how do I describe the presence of being with God? It's just something you can't describe. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, he described heaven like this. He says, what is heaven? It's the enjoyment of God. Heaven is a kingdom of glory. The place where the great king displays his infinite perfections to the utmost. Billy Graham famously said this, one day you will hear that Billy Graham has died. Don't believe a word of it. On that day, I will be more alive than I've ever been. Amen. How about all of you? What do you think about when you think of heaven? Is it the joy of being back with those that went before you? 
Is it the absence of pain and suffering? Maybe you're in the choir. It's a joy of hearing those angels singing. But here's where I have to tell you, hold your horses. Whoa, Nellie. As we reflect on these profound insights to life after death, you have to consider the implications on our life here and now. This promise, this pilgrim reward, it's only for believers. If you truly believe in immortality, the soul, and the promise of eternal life, are you compelled to live your life with greater intentionality? Or is tomorrow just going to be another day? Does it make you rethink your priorities in the here and now, or are you too attached to the world and you've got other things you've got to be thinking about, like going back to school with a mortgage payment? Like all good things in life, even the promise of heaven comes with a catch. Yep, there's strings attached. Someone's going, see, I knew it. Here's the catch. It's not enough to just simply believe in the afterlife. You have to actively prepare yourself to that eternal reality now. That means you have to examine your beliefs and values. And you have to seek forgiveness for all those places where you're falling short. It means you have to practice compassion and kindness towards other people. And it means telling everyone you know the promise of the eternal life, the promise that the only way to the Father is through the Son. It's these qualities that shape the nature of your eternal existence. And I'm going to close right here. I gave you just but a brief brief glimpse of the profound beauty and wonder that awaits all of us beyond this earthly existence. As people of faith, we hold on to the promise of eternal, transcendent reality. That's a promise that gives us hope and it gives us courage to navigate all the ups and downs of living in this world. And we have, Lord, when I was, we have lots of ups and downs. I'm not going to lie to you. I say this to you almost every week. Being a Christian is hard. And especially between the Sundays, that's a battle for all of us. Yet here we are. Pilgrims on this earth passing through because this isn't our world. Our kingdom is elsewhere. We are citizens of God's world. So this morning as we reflect on the wonder of life and the promise of eternity, I just ask that you all be renewed in your faith. I want you to be emboldened in the mission to share the hope to all the world, like Sandra's sister is going to go do in Guatemala. Let us do at Paradise Grill, at the barber shop, around the corner. Let's hold fast to this pilgrim pathway. And may it shape the way we live, the way we love, and the way we prepare for the eternal glory that waits us all. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are just so thankful for the story, the road map that you gave us called the Bible that tells us that from the beginning we're broken and all those self-help sections and suggestions and guide us and emergency procedures that are in that user's manual that takes us all the way to that last chapter where you tell us exactly what the end's going to look like. and that glorious reward that you've promised if we only believe. 
And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.